Today, we're going to be speaking to John Mark Hansen, who's a professor in political science at the University of Chicago. We are going to talk a little bit about uh, what would it look like to rig and or steal an American presidential election? Uh, Mark, it's great to have you on. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, OK, I mean, at this point, I don't think we have to rehash all of the claims that were made between November 4th and January 6th or January 20th or even up until today and continue to be made. L- let's just get into the reality. So so maybe the audience can understand what would go into this. Could could a, a, an American presidential election, which is really 50 state elections, could it be rigged? Could it be stolen? How would it have to be done if so? Well, I would say that it's difficult to the point of impossible. Um, I think many people just don't understand the scale of the effort that would be involved to actually fix a presidential election. You're not talking about a few hundred votes. You're not talking about a few thousand votes. You're talking about tens or even hundreds of thousands of votes uh, spread along a number of states. So there are folks who will say, well, you know, 80 million votes versus 75 million or whatever. You you don't really need to flip millions of votes. You really need, for example, in 2016, it was 77,000 votes in three states. In 2020, it was depending on how you slice it, about 100,000 votes. That's very different than millions. So that presumably would make it simpler. Uh, simpler, but not by any means simple. Um, if you imagine what it would take to shift uh, a number of votes and and bear in mind that you don't know exactly where the problem is going to be. You don't know exactly what the margin you need is and you don't know exactly where it's going to be. Uh, So you have to start months in advance uh, and you have to be thinking in terms of tens of thousands of votes uh, and you have to be thinking about how it is that you would recruit tens of thousands of people to participate in this effort uh, without uh, anybody blowing a whistle on you. OK, so let me play devil's advocate. Maybe you don't need to recruit tens of thousands. If you can just get a few tech people who, quote, control the voting machines, that might be a simple way. And you might only need five or six people. Well, that is the case. However, um, you still have to maintain a conspiracy of those five or six people. Um, And one of the things we know is it's very difficult to maintain conspiracies. So there are many, many business frauds that go awry uh, or criminal frauds or or criminal activities that go awry because people feel the need to say something, um, either because they want to boast about it uh, or because they have a guilty conscience or whatever. So you would have to to, uh, have a great deal of trust in your Confederates. Um, But even beyond that, uh, there are lots and lots and lots of barriers that have been erected to actually manipulating the vote in that way. Uh, There are security measures for the technology that's used in voting and vote counting. Uh, And moreover, there's the knowledge of the um, uh, there's the knowledge of the people who are overseeing the voting process. Um, And so if some county comes in all of a sudden with 10,000 more votes than they've ever cast before, someone might say, boy, that looks kind of fishy. Maybe we ought to look closer at that. Uh, There are so many different claims that have been made about mechanisms for subterfuge, some of which conflict with each other. And maybe I don't know how much we need to necessarily get into that. But just to talk about a few of the different things, there's, as I mentioned, the idea of simply using uh, hacking skills to change the vote tallies of a group of voting machines. We heard stories of so-called massive dumps of ballots coming in in the middle of the night on vans and and literally just taking boxes of ballots out, which presumably in that case, the voting machines aren't being manipulated, but someone's feeding in a bunch of ballots. There's the idea of having election workers look at ballots and then disqualify only some, presumably to help one candidate and hurt the other. All of these are based on different principles. And what to me seems very difficult would be that you might end up with one of these strategies working against a different one, conflicting. The coordination of such strategies seems extraordinarily difficult. Yeah, it's it's enormously difficult. Um, uh, take, take, for instance, the idea of a bunch of ballots that get dumped. So most states, uh, most jurisdictions, in fact, allow partisan observers to ballot counting. Um, And so all of a sudden these ballots come in and someone might say, so where did they come from? 
um, how do we know that they're authentic? Um, there should be a mark on the ballot. Um, there should be some kind of record that the person at the polling place actually authorized this person to vote. Uh, or if it's an absentee ballot, it should meet the requirements for absentee ballots, which oftentimes include a signature. Um, they include a ballot application, all kinds of things. So there are all kinds of safeguards uh, to prevent ballots from being submitted fraudulently, and certainly all kinds of safeguards to make sure that uh, if there are frauds, that there's a likelihood of their being discovered, particularly on a large scale. Yeah, when it comes to in-person voter fraud, uh, the idea of someone, I, I don't even know, sometimes it's not even clear to me exactly how you would do it. You would go to multiple polling places or show up and claim to be a variety of different people. I mean, you wouldn't be registered in multiple places. So going to polling places as you wouldn't wouldn't work. I guess you could show up and say at one polling place, you say you're Joe Smith and at the next place you say you, you say you're Steve Johnson and that type of thing. But it seems like in order to flip 50,000 votes with that strategy, you need thousands of people making it incredibly unlikely to be able to do it secretly. Exactly. Exactly. Just think about recruiting such a number of people. So somehow you're going to have to find a bunch of people who are willing to take the risk uh, either to their freedom or to their uh, pocketbook or to their reputations uh, to participate in all of this. And you're going to have to make sure that you don't reach anybody who has a healthy enough conscience that they would blow the whistle on you. When it comes to um, people getting caught attempting to do these things, from looking at the Brennan Center for Justice's work on this, which has looked at over a billion votes over I don't I don't know how many years, many, many years, um, they say that this in-person voter fraud is not only extremely rare, but there is not even a single case in which it has come close to actually affecting the outcome of of a race. Right. Uh, there are people who will claim, maybe cynically, maybe not, that just because this uh, Brennan Center gives us these numbers, it doesn't address the number of people that are getting away with it, which simply don't show up when you hear about, oh, 20 people were caught trying to do this. How can we defeat the idea that maybe there are lots of people not caught doing it? Well, again, I think the you have to kind of do the math on it. Um, so any kind of large scale effort means that the difficulties go up, the costs go up uh, and the risk of exposure goes up. Uh, the more people who are involved in this, the more votes that are involved in this, the greater the likelihood that it's going to be found. So, yeah, maybe there are people who get away with it, but there are people who get away with it maybe affecting one or two votes. Um, you know, out of all the scrutiny that this last election got, um, so far, the only indictment that we've seen for any kind of voting irregularities was a man in Pennsylvania who voted an absentee ballot for his mother. Right. For Donald Trump. So. You know, that's the that's the typical kind of thing that we see in these cases. Um, most cases of vote fraud or alleged vote fraud are not even prosecuted because it's people making honest mistakes. Right? They thought that they were registered, but they weren't. Um, or they thought that they were eligible in this jurisdiction, but they weren't or so forth. So uh, most of these cases uh, have quite innocent explanations. What would be of all of these different mechanisms? What's the one you're most likely to get away with? Oh, boy. Um, I'm not sure that there are that many possibilities anymore. You know, back in the bad old days, there used to be a fair bit of vote fraud. It was committed both by Republicans and by Democrats. Um, and as a result of that, um, you know, election officials learn through time uh, what those uh, what those frauds look like, um, and they learned about how to take security measures to make sure that those frauds didn't occur. Um, and so, by now, with a century of experience with the Australian ballot, with the secret ballot, uh, we have lots and lots of of experience in this. Um, and it's not like people have just been twiddling their thumbs and saying "oh me, oh my" when they encounter problems. They've taken steps to avoid them in the future. When it comes to the U.S. having these 50 election systems plus D.C., I guess you'd say, you know, it's 51 election systems. One could make the argument that 
um, the election is less secure because you have so many different systems. But on the other hand, you could make the argument that having all of these systems actually makes it more secure because in order to really do some kind of fraud at a, at a big level, you, you'd have to figure out a way to manipulate multiple different systems. Do you think that having the 51 different systems on balance makes the election more or less secure? No, that's a good question. I think you could argue it both ways. Um, certainly one could argue that if you have separate systems, uh, you might not have all jurisdictions adopting best practices. Mm. Uh, and that would be an argument for a more uniform system. Um, on the other hand, uh, if it is a matter of some kind of technical expertise uh, to manipulate these systems, then having a wide variety of systems means that you have to have a greater variety of technical expertise in order to do anything significant. Do you think that because of all of the the smears that we've heard over the last two, three months about the election of 2020, there's going to be a skepticism about the system in some parts uh, among some communities that will last a long time? Or is it as simple as if in 2022 politicians don't make these claims, people will generally speaking trust the systems again? Well, I think that there is now a partisan reason not to, quote unquote, trust the system. Mm. Whether that actually translates into people behaving in a different way, I think, is another question entirely. Uh, there are all these um, uh, concerns in Georgia, for instance, in the Senate runoff that, uh, that Donald Trump's uh, uh, casting aspersions on the fairness of the Georgia election would mean that Republicans would stay home. Um, why? <laughs> right. Why, why, then why they would, definitely lose. <laughs> Right, right. Why, why would you do that? So, so um, I, I'm, I'm skeptical that it will matter uh, a whole lot. What it, what it does do, however, is to raise the possibility of just casting doubt on the legitimacy of every election outcome. And that's right. a bad thing. Yeah. And that uh, it seemed I mean, I, I there was a woman who confronted Mitt Romney in an airport a couple of weeks ago and almost like as a reflexive thing, she said, you weren't, your election wasn't even legitimate. And like, who, who, I didn't even know the Utah 2018 election was being challenged in terms of its legitimacy. It seems it's becoming a catch-all for, I don't like that you won. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and, and this has been brewing for a while. It's been a Republican strategy since 2010, uh, basically to elect more, to erect more and more and more barriers um, to, the um, to, to voting and and particularly to the constituencies that tend to vote Democratic, um, just in order to keep one's opponents away from the polls. Um, right. So, you know, this is actually and, and in that respect, the 2020 election was something of an embarrassment uh, because we had uh, easier access to voting than we've ever had before in our history. Um, and we have a whistle clean election. So now what are they going to claim? <laughs> right. Uh, how how can they how can they say, well, actually, things do work. Um, and so we get a doubling down on these fraud claims. Yeah. And uh, in fact, Christopher Krebs, uh, who worked for Donald Trump, said exactly that it was fine and he was fired. And so we yeah. see uh, the, the political nature that that it's taking on. Uh, we've been speaking with Professor John Mark Hansen, who teaches political science at the University of Chicago. So great having you on today. I really appreciate it. It's been fun. Thank you.